Well, hello again, friends. Appreciate the opportunity and the privilege of being able to share God's word with you once again. Last week, we did kind of a survey of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians as we learned that there is an emphasis on the hope that we have because of the promise and the expectation of Christ's return. This letter is filled with references to the second coming of Christ, and we'll find one or more in every chapter. Now, yesterday was a pretty emotional day for me because, first of all, our fourth grandchild, Miles Jason, was born in the afternoon. Mom and baby are doing fine, and we're thankful for this new little man in our lives. But also, yesterday was uh, was kind of bittersweet because we said goodbye to a dear friend, a woman who I had the privilege of being the pastor of for over 31 years, and did the memorial service for Joyce Bryan. And one of the things that she was known for was a greeting she would say, Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus. And she lived with the expectation of Christ's return. Now, Jesus hasn't come yet, but instead God chose to call her home to heaven and be with him. And now she's blessed to see the Lord Jesus face to face. So we call her uh, memorial service, we call it a homegoing celebration. Now, loved ones, only Christians can genuinely call a funeral or a memorial service a celebration of joy and, and confidence. Now, surely there's going to be a sadness and a grief, but that's mostly because she's just going to be missed. But because Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave, Death is not the end, because when Jesus died, he took our sins upon himself, and he bore our judgment, and in return, he applied his perfect righteousness to our account. And that's the basis of our hope, friends. We can enter heaven on the merits of the only perfectly sinless man that ever lived, our Lord Jesus. So, let's begin looking at Paul's letter and see what we can learn from him. I want to begin by reading his greeting in the first four verses. So Paul says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to you, or we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father, uh, God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God. It's interesting that Paul doesn't identify himself here as an apostle by the will of God, which he usually did, but he usually did that because his authority as an apostle and a teacher was being challenged or questioned. Now, of course, that wasn't the case here. However, he did this time mention his ministry team. Silvanus, which is really just another name for Silas, he replaced Barnabas when Barnabas and Paul split over a dis disagreement about taking John Mark with them on a second missionary journey. Barnabas wanted to give Mark another chance, but Paul wouldn't have it because Mark had bailed on him the first time. So Paul refused to take him. So they split. Barnabas took Mark, and they went on their way, and Paul took Silas, his new ministry partner, and they went on the second missionary journey. You can read about this in Acts chapter 15. And then, of course, Timothy, he became a member of their gospel team when he joined them in Lystra. You read about that in Acts 16, just before God called them to go into Macedonia, entering into Europe with the gospel. But Timothy was a great asset to Paul's team because his mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. So that was helpful for them as they traveled through Europe. But you know, one of the things that I love about Paul was that he valued the members of his team. He wasn't a one-man show. Even though he authored this letter, his greeting to the church included his friends because they all had a love for these saints. And so he begins with grace and peace. He's actually pronouncing a blessing on them. They've already received a just, the justifying grace that resulted in peace with God. He wants them to know now the sanctifying grace that leads to the peace of God. 
and all the other blessings really that come by way of his grace when we receive Jesus Christ. Remember that grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God upon us. But in either case, the order is the same. Grace must always come before peace can be realized. But it was almost always Paul's way of opening up his letters. Now, the church in Thessalonica was started by Paul and Silas, even though they were run out of the city after about three weeks. He spent three weeks, three Sabbaths rather, in the synagogue. You can read about the trouble that they had with the Jews there in Acts chapter 17, but it was, uh, it was long enough for this church to get started. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul says that he sent Timothy there to strengthen and encourage them in their faith. Then in verses 2 and 3, he gives thanks to the Lord and he celebrates this church as he remembers them. You know, you got any saints that fill your heart with gratitude when you think about them? I know I do. And as Paul thinks about these thanks, saints in Thessalonica, his heart is glad and he lifts them up in prayer, thanking God because he continually remembers the evidence of their genuine salvation that was being shown. And so Paul mentions, first of all, their work of faith. Now, obviously, this is talking about their work for the Lord. It's the reason that we were saved, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For by grace through faith were you saved, that not of works. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. But he goes on to say in verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. James tells us that faith without works is dead. In other words, it's useless. It's of no value to God. Someone said that we're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. These Thessalonian believers were proving by their works that their salvation was real. Something else that proved their salvation was real was their labor of love. John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14 that another evidence of saving faith is love for the brethren. A few verses later, he says that, he says though that it's not love in word or tongue, but rather it's word, love in deed and in truth. We show love in tangible ways. Now, yesterday, we were able to spread some love to Joyce's family as the church hosted the memorial service. And many of the ladies in our church provided a ton of food and served them. That word labor literally means to toil. And believe me, some of these ladies toiled hard yesterday. I thank God for all of you if you're watching this, but especially my wife, because what she did here was definitely a labor of love and and I know at the end of the day, she was exhausted. But she did this, and so did the other ladies, because they loved Joyce, and they loved their family. Well, then the third evidence of true faith that Paul was thanking God for was their patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and Father, in the sight of God, our God and Father. There is an assurance that's provided by our hope in the return of Christ that enables us to withstand the pressure and the wickedness of a world that would like nothing more than to squelch our hope. It helps us to remain steadfast and it inspires us to keep living in the light of eternity, just like Joyce did. This Greek word for, for patience is hupomone. Trench, a 19th century Anglican bishop, wrote that this word hupomone does not mark merely endurance or even patience, but the perseverance, the brave patience with which the Christian contends against the various hindrances, persecutions, and temptations that befall him in his conflict with the inward and outward world. And he goes on to say that the temper of spirit in which we accept God's dealings with us as good and therefore without disputing and resisting. Now, we'll learn much more about this patience of hope as we make our way through this letter, but there's a whole lot happening in the world today that attacks our faith and seeks to discourage and defeat Christians. 
But love one's saving faith, selfless love, and a patient hope will enable us to persevere. Someone well said that faith looks back to a crucified Savior, love looks up to a crowned Savior, and hope looks on to a coming Savior. <laughs> but they're all wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 4, knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God. Those last four words have bred a lot of misunderstanding and troubled many critics about God's sovereignty as it applies to his redemptive work. In fact, it was the topic of last Sunday's message as Paul said that we were chosen before the foundation of the world in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. So I want to try to limit my comments since I did a whole message on it, if I can. But uh, the question that arises is, does God choose sinners to be saved and then provide for their salvation? Or does God provide for their way of salvation that sinners must choose for themselves? <laughs> the answer is yes. The doctrine of election is clearly taught in the scriptures, but so is the responsibility of us for us to make the decision to believe the gospel. To start with, we have to understand that God is sovereign. That means that he's in total control of his creation. And for many people, this is difficult to grasp because of the existence of evil and the dark side of humanity. But that word election simply means to pick or to choose. And here it's in the middle voice, which means that he literally chose for himself. He chose by himself for himself. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, whole, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And again, as I began teaching through Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, that says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Now, Lord willing, I'll finish that passage this coming Sunday, but Paul tells us here that he chose us even before creation. We weren't an afterthought. This is an eternity past. We were on God's heart. Paul makes another statement about us being chosen by God when he wrote, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Even the word church implies that we've been chosen. The word ecclesia means called out one. And so the Bible teaches that the church is composed of those believing individuals who are divinely elected to salvation, chosen from eternity past, completely apart from any merit or righteousness on our part, solely for God's purposes. Can't reconcile them in our minds, but they're both taught. So I hope we can believe them both. Now, Immediately, the question that may come to your mind is, is, if God chose those who are to be saved, then he also chose those who are condemned to be damned. Well, the answer is, no, it doesn't. Because that would make God responsible for unbelief and condemnation. And the Bible makes it clear that men are responsible to believe the gospel. They will be held accountable. God's not responsible. Now, I don't know how that works. That's something that God will have to reveal to us when we see him. Paul was asked what to do. He replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. In Peter's first sermon, he says, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. John said, as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God. So, you know, maybe you're thinking I'm crazy. How can the Bible teach divine election and at the same time hold men accountable to, accountable to believe? I admit it's a paradox. And it's really impossible for 
us to reconcile in our finite human minds. And my opinion is that anyone who thinks that they've got it figured out is just too, too, too arrogant, really, to admit that they don't understand it. Like I said last Sunday, I just have to trust what the prophet Isaiah wrote. Isaiah 55 and verses 8 and 9, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I think D.L. Moody probably said it best. He said, the elect are the whosoever wills, and the non-elect are the whosoever wants. Sovereign election of God and the responsibility of man are like two sides of the same coin. My pastor used to describe it as that as we approach the gates of heaven, we look across and we see an arch that says, whosoever will may enter. You go through the gates and you look around and you see the arch on the other side from the inside, and it says, chosen from the foundation of the world. So how do you know if you're one of God's elect? Well, Paul says here, it's because of their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. These are all the evidence that they are genuinely saved, that they are God's elect. So the question is, have you believed? Has your life been changed? Paul says a few verses later on, he says that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Loved ones, we are Secure precisely because our salvation is a work of God, not ourselves. In the same way, our sanctification is a work of God. We yield ourselves to him and he perfects us through his grace. In regard to this, someone said, if your faith frizzles before you finish, it was faulty from the beginning. <laughs> if we are part of God's elect, than what Paul is telling us in the opening of this letter and then throughout, that there will be plenty of evidence. Hope your life gives some evidence. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this letter that Paul wrote to some genuine believers whose life gave a clear testimony of what genuine saving faith really looks like. May our lives show as clearly as theirs that we are true followers of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I hope that you are sure of your salvation and that your life gives plenty of evidence in the same way the lives of the Thessalonians did. Now, I just want you to know before I say goodbye, there's always an open invitation for you to contact me if you want to talk about it. Nothing I'd love more. So thanks again for joining me. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Bye.